Okay, so the slides is always uh, coevolving.com slash common slash publications. And you, these are leave behind slides. And so you, you might want to look at them later because what I've done is I've condensed a lot of the literature that is behind this. Um, just to recap a little bit on where we are, um, one of the things I picked up for reading the, uh, the projects of what you handed in and one of the shifts that you're, you're, you've gone through, and we kind of got this at the beginning, was that uh, the way we should be thinking about the world is less as fixing problems and more as thinking systems changes. So are we thinking about those systems changes and we're just talking about coronavirus? It's kind of like, it's not like there haven't been infections before. So what's different? Now uh, we've kind of gone through, and uh, the, the the title of this talk that I'm only going to get through about half of this talk. Uh, Peter said that maybe I'll do uh, later in the uh, in the program if we have time. We'll do uh, the other part of it. Uh, but I, I backed up from the idea. How many people read the disclosing new worlds article or tried? Uh, that was the short one. Here's the book. Yeah, so it's, it's it's difficult. And so what I've done is I backed up from language action, and and the question that uh, I'm posing is a how question: How do system changes become natural practice? Because you want the systems to change in a certain way, but they don't, and they kind of bite back. And so behind the disclosing new world is actually this idea of history making. Are you actually making history? Or is it just a little change, just a little fix that you're doing? There's commitment associated with that. We've talked about human systems, and the argumentation and pattern language is stuff that we're not going to cover because we don't have time today. But uh, one of the things that you um, uh, need to understand as you work forward on your, uh, on your synthesis maps is it affects, I'm not about the form of the synthesis maps, I'm all about the content on the synthesis maps, because these maps have the story that are systems. And so if you're coming at your synthesis map from the perspective of solving a problem, you're probably doing it wrong. You have to back up and think about the system and what's happening in the system. And it's not easy because there's multiple systems at play. Now, there's been a lot of changes, and this is where we get uh, to my, uh, my grudge. When I, when I was ISSS president, I wrote this article called Rethinking Systems Thinking. And the problem I see with a lot of systems thinking is that it's anchored in the 1980s. And, and that's kind of not the world we're in today. That's pre-internet, it's pre-globalization. And so what happens if we think about the world differently? There's an interesting book that came out in 2001, and it's called The Practice Turning Contemporary Theory. This is not a book you want to read. Uh, but what it says is that this idea of practice. So as a philosophy, we've never had this idea of practice where we understand what people do. We have epistemology where we talk about how people think and why you should think about it. But what we should think about is how, what, how people do things in practice. So practice brings in things like knowledge, meaning, human activities, science, power, language, social institutions, and historical transformation. So anyone that thinks that you just change the system, it's kind of like, you're changing all those things? <laughs> the, the typical change management approach is based off Kurt, it's actually now Kurt Levine, it's people call it Kurt Lewin. And the idea is called, uh, uh, and, and most of the people who work in this have this idea of change as three steps. And this article from 2016 talks about unfreezing change and change, uh, uh, thinking about his legacy. But essentially, all of the change management programs have this fundamental idea that you unfreeze the system, you change the system, and then you refreeze. So firstly, can you unfreeze a system? So we'll talk about difference between complexity and complicatedness. So complexity was the scrambled egg, the beaten egg, and the complicated was the egg and the yolk separately. So you say, okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to unfreeze the beaten egg. And it's like, wow, that's going to take a lot of effort. And then after you 
do that, you're going to try to change that, and change it to what, and then refreeze it, and it's going to stick after you refreeze it. We had the idea before of these, um, uh, the blanket and the balls we are talking about, and the balls fall to the valleys. Okay, so what happens in another valley? Well, to stay in that valley, is it shallow or is it deep? It's going to pop out. So this whole idea is based off this mechanistic thing, and it turns out that people kind of credit it to Kurt Levine, saying that this was his model. If you actually go back and look at his writing, which is what these authors have done, he never said that. And so you've got a whole field of change management saying, well, this is how we do change, and you kind of go, oh, no, that's not how you do change. So how is it you should be doing change, and this is where practice starts coming in. Uh, so we're going to talk about, firstly, situated learning and history making, the idea of legitimate peripheral participation and practices, and I'll explain that. All the stuff goes into the knowledge management and uh, community practice work. Uh, skill acquisition and disclosing new worlds, because if you're actually asking people to change, do they have the skill to change? Do you have the skill to guide them to change? We'll have then a, a section on commitment and language action perspective. Commitment, when someone says they're going to do something, are they actually going to do it? What are the mechanisms behind that? We have what are called conversations for action, and then I have an extension on that, on deliverables, procedures, capacities, or relationships. Uh, we're not going to cover um, argumentation of pattern language. Uh, Riddle was part of the reading over the break, and so um, he goes a direction where you do information uh, issues-based information systems. Um, and then uh, if you really want to talk to me offline, uh, Open Innovation Learning, which is the book I published, is based off all of this, it's based off the theory of practice. Now where we are, and so the first lecture I gave essentially was on which and what. The second lecture I gave was on why. The last lecture was on whom, why, and when. And now we're focused on how. And the question for us is really collective action. Because when you're talking about systems, there are systems as individuals, and there are systems of us as a group, as a team, as a society, that are all collective. <clears throat> so if we're not looking at unfreeze, change, freeze, how is it that we actually move into a different approach? And some of this comes, there's an uh, uh, article in 1996, and so it says, scratching the economic rate and maintaining change, I did the change of the three-stage process. Okay, that comes from Levine. And what he says is that what we should do instead is look at community of practice, people share their knowledge uh, about the work practice, they affirm and modify their theories and use, and they manage and repair the social context. The examples that we're going to talk about come from the work of Jean Lave, and she's an anthropologist who worked at Xerox uh, and worked at the Institute for Research on Learning. And so a lot of the work starts off, and it has that flavor when you're talking about the work practice, but these are people that work more generally. And uh, the, the uh, idea that comes up in, in one of Jean Lave's work is in West Africa, how do you become a tailor? How is it you actually become a tailor? Because you come in as a novice and you don't know how to sew, and after a couple of years of working, all of a sudden you're a master tailor. And how does that happen? I have a whole blog post on this. This is on the Co Evolving site. If you actually want to trace through it, uh, I do this at length, I discovered. Uh, but legitimate peripheral participation is the term that Gene Leaves started. Legitimate peripheral participation. So let's break that apart. Participation, because if you're going to learn something, you have to be part of a group that's doing it. You can't just get a book and say, I'm a tailor. You have to actually do it and be part of that group. You have to participate. You have to be, you start off peripheral, because firstly, you have to be allowed into the group. So, Tailors are busy people, they're kind of saying, well, you know, I want someone who actually has skill, someone that's colorblind, I don't know if I'm going to have to you know, waste my time with them. Legitimate, <clears throat> legitimate, legitimation is a process whereby you actually become part of the community. Now, I make this joke that I am a researcher, not really a teacher, which is one of the reasons that I don't, I'm, not, I'm not usually a professor at university teaching, 
And what happens is that in saying that, I'm actually giving you a clue about my legitimacy. I don't claim to be the best teacher. I claim to be a researcher. So you use me as a researcher. I also have this other joke. When I was writing my book, uh, it was on open sourcing. And so who's my research assistant? He was the vice president of open source for IBM. Because he blogged. And so it's like, oh, he's, he's blogging. I have a research assistant for me now. And the guy's current. So you can use me in that way. I'm legitimate in the research community. I'm not necessarily legitimate in the teaching community, but there are any teaching credentials. Uh, yes? Uh, we're trying to, it's an academic setting, we're trying to set up a community practice, mm -hmm. and it's something new. And it's funny because the academics that, uh, that I work with are like, yeah, let's do it, let's just kick it off, hand it over to them. And I work in communications, and I'm like, mm, how are you going to monitor this? How are you going to keep it from turning into something that could potentially damage the brand? So when you kind of hand over from a brand perspective, the community of practice, and it's something that you maintain on your channels. How do you? It's hard to ensure that in your academics, you're probably not going to go anywhere, you know, really inappropriate or anything like that, but it could happen. And how do you kind of mitigate that? So, the, I, the question I would ask would you, because, so, so you are not one of the community practices, right? No. You are not. So the first issue you've got is that you are not legitimate in that community. Oh, totally, yeah. Right. And so... child, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So in order for you to make traction, you have to have to become legitimate. So, so in the pattern language community, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of communities around... Uh, uh, number one is, uh, is uh, PLOP, the Pattern Language and Programming Conference, which has been running for 25 years. And so I started, I, I, I've done all the pattern language work inside of IBM, but no one's ever seen it. So I started at the conference, and at first, because the first thing you're going to get is, you don't understand Christopher Alexander, right? That's the, you're not legitimate. And so I went to that conference, I went to Asian plot, I went to Purple Sock, which is a pattern language of uh, social change. Uh, I went to Pearl, which is the, uh, the conference where the architects are, not social change people. I can, Building architects, that's where Pattern Life came from. So I now have legitimacy in that community, but it took me four years. So the people who run the community of practice, and I can totally appreciate that in order, if I was the one that was going to run it, then I would say, okay, yes, for legitimacy for sure. I would say, right, they all have multiple PhDs, um, like, you know, trying for a master's degree, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in a non science field. Yeah. So, however, the people who are running, the community of practice, they're very much have credibility. They're researchers themselves. Okay. Established. Let's take some offline because I've got a lot to cover underneath this. Like, I'll yeah. get to all the dimensions of this. So, yeah. so let's but take, let's take like off the monitor, but not. Yeah, no, we have, we have to take it offline because I've got a lot to cover. Okay. okay. And, we'll, and we'll get there. Okay, so the apprenticeship that Jane Lay studied was among midwives. So, how do you be legitimate as a midwife? Uh, the tailors, quartermasters, butchers, and then the most interesting one is non-drinking alcoholics at Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, this is obviously not a work setting when you get into Alcoholics Anonymous. How do you actually become legitimate that someone will actually, you know, sit in the circle and talk with you as an equal? You have to be an alcoholic. Right? So, declared alcoholic or do something. You can't just come in and say, oh, I just want to watch this meeting. No, get out of here because no. you're not you're not part of the group. Well, what you mean? can you can fake it like in Fight Club. They're called <laughs> tourists, and that's that's actually a big part of Fight Club. Tourists. Yeah. That's actually why Al Anon started because so many mm. people were showing up who were children of alcoholics mm -hmm. that that weren't yeah. actual alcoholics. Yeah, that's a good example of LPP. Actually, yeah, Al Anon. So we'll start off with, uh, this is uh, A.T.N. Wenger's book, 1999, which is pretty well the whole book that started up the whole field of knowledge management, getting people to understand what knowledge management is all about. I'll tell you that if, 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 when you, if you go and try to read this book, this is just slightly simpler than the Disclosing New Worlds. And so I don't know that I recommend it. Uh, I'm going to try to jump over some of the key ideas and, and some of the uh, images that he has to get the idea. 
But essentially, the idea that he has his community practice involves social participation and learning and knowing. So it's not just knowing that you are a master, but you have to be part of the learning along the way. That includes meaning, practice, community, and identity. So let's start off with meaning. A way of talking about changing ability, individually, collectively, to experience our lives in the world is meaningful. So if we go back to the tailor, what does it mean to be a tailor? And what shows up for them when they actually come in to work? So, you know, I'm not, I'm not a tailor, I'm not into fashion, and I see all these bolts of cloth, and it's kind of like, they mean nothing to me. But they mean a lot to the tailor. The different types of scissors they use, the needles, the sewing machines, all these sorts of things, they have meaning for them, they don't have meaning for me. So the learning experience comes along with that. Practice, a way of talking with a shared historical and social resources, frameworks, and, and perspectives that can sustain mutual engagement and action. So what is it we're actually doing? What is it that tailors do? How is it they actually make clothes? Number three, community, a way of talking about social configuration, which our enterprise defined as worth pursuing and our participation is recognized as competence. Learning as belonging. You belong to a community or you don't belong to a community. Being assigned as a consultant almost always guarantees you you are not part of the community because you're an outsider. Unless you're in a community of consultants. Community of consultants, yes. <laughs> Which makes it very paradoxical to be a consultant <laughs> that's trying to uh, foment organizational change. So if your job is to change your organization, you're coming in particularly as an individual consultant as like a single, you know, uh, 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 you know, bringing provocations into the organization, having them, you know, or reorganize, you know, for communities of practice and things, or as a, as a large consulting firm, it's very, yeah, fraud. <laughs> Try to make change. Yeah, it's you're not part of the group. So number four is identity, a way of talking about how learning changes who we are and creates personal histories of becoming in the context of our communities. Learning as becoming. So you don't become a master tailor overnight. And, and so we, we actually end up with this trade-off. Now, in, in teaching the class of teaching systems thinking, when, when Peter speaks and he talks about the history of systems thinking, that's part of the identity, is you need to understand how people got here. So we're not inventing new ideas. We're building, we're standing on the shoulders of others. And you kind of understand people that actually know that there's actually been a community practice out there. The people that actually try to work against in systems thinking communities are people, there are a few I'll leave unnamed, who cite nobody. You ask, where'd you get that idea? Oh, I was walking in the woods and I got this idea. It's like, have you done any reading? Do you think anyone else might have done some thinking about this in a couple of thousand years? It's not like this is new. So, so having that identity comes with, uh, comes with a learning as belonging. Now, this is going to dive in um, to where the theories come from, and this is where it gets really deep with Wenger, because he says, in order to create a theory of social learning, I'm going to need to draw on a lot of other places. And so he starts off with theories of social structure that, that are institutions, norms, and rules, cultural systems, discourses, and histories. And so a lot of people come at it and say, oh, we'll just reorganize. We'll reorganize the company. Or, you know, we'll change the way that we fund, and that'll change everything. And you kind of go, well, it doesn't. There's still informal organizations, how they fit in, but you need that, those initial uh, theories of social structure. Against that, you've got the theories of situated experience that talk about the dynamics, improvisation, coordination, because people don't always follow the rules. We're not talking about people as machines here, so you have the structures in place, social structures, yes. But then on top of that, you've got the situated experience, which is when you actually go and you join a company, you join a team, and they go, well, you know, here's the standard operating manual, and this is the way the company works. And then you go and you have coffee or a cigarette with someone, and they say, oh, let me tell you, that's not the way the company works at all. That's the book, and that's the rule, but that's not the way it works. So you've got this tension between the social structure and the situated experience. You've got theories of social practice that address the production and reproduction of ways of engaging in the world. There's an idea, there's two ideas that are closely related. One is the reproduction of social practice, 
So why is it that you do things? And it's because other people have done it, and it works. It's a pragmatic approach. It's not necessarily out of the textbook. So when you go to a doctor's office, you know, what do they prescribe? Well, they don't necessarily prescribe you the most leading edge drug unless they've actually been in the community that's doing research associated with leading edge drugs. They give you what's based off their experience, and this has worked before, and so you know, doctors have a practice. Against that, you've got theories of identity, concerned with the social formation of the person, the cultural interpretation, because again, not everyone is the same. So although we say that there's a social practice, you recognize there are good doctors, there are bad doctors, there are good tailors, there are bad tailors. And they're all practicing. And you could say good or bad is maybe a different, uh, a, too uh, judgmental. It could be that this person is really strong in this aspect of the practice and is weak in other ones. And then when you work in a team, you get those covered and people can work with each other. Now this is actually an eight. What, what he does, he starts off with these four and then he fills in between them, and I'm not going to cover them, but you end up with between social structure and identity, there's theories of power that happen. Between identity and situated experience, there's theories of subjectivity. Between situated experience or practice, there's theories of meanings. And between theories of social structure or practice, there are theories of common activity. So this is a book that is really, really rich. That's why I couldn't answer your question, because it's all these sort of things you bring to bear. So you might want to tackle the book. Yeah. I'm looking for it on the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's one of those things where when you get these difficult books, don't read them slowly. Read them quickly and read them multiple times. So when, uh, picking, and if you haven't caught on the systems literature yet, the best way to read the systems literature is read it really fast. <laughs> and then it's kind of like, okay, what are they saying? And you go to another person, you go, what are they saying? Oh, they're saying the same thing, they're saying something different. And then you come back, and, and then you go, well, where's the difference between these two people? And then you focus on reading more deeply. But if you're going to read, read quickly, and then talk about it with other people. That's the best way to do it, because reading quickly gives you the big ideas. Like, I'm trying to give you the big ideas here, and they kind of go, well, that's not my problem. You know, I don't need... The vertical axis, I can work on the horizontal axis, that's where the problem is. So for designers, at the end of the book, and this is where you might start with the end of the book, as opposed to going through the beginning, because this is like page 250 or something, it's like the end. Um, he says, there is conceptual architecture that guides design with general questions, choices, and trade-offs of what needs to be achieved. Now, place it in the context of Xerox Institute for Research on Learning, which has Xerox Park right beside it. So you've got people that are coming in with computers and, in effect, design the interface that predated the Macintosh, right? How do you get people to change from 2D practice where everyone's got these green screens and they're typing in text? And, and, and now we're talking about people and technology together, which is a practice. You have to, the system you're trying to work on is a system of practice that includes both tools and social interactions between the individuals and with the tools that are mediated. So in design, you have the ideas of participation and reification. So there are two ideas. So the idea of affordances comes out here. So you participate when you are designing. You are you are designing how people participate in their work. So not there are very few jobs where everyone does the whole thing by themselves. You have a team that's working on it. So how is it that people participate, and how do you reify? Because, as we're saying, different people have different strengths on your team, or in your group, or in your society. So how is it you actually now negotiate between having people join you, and then having actually bringing out people's strengths? And that's where, that's, as part of it's on each of us as individuals to go, you know, I'm not really strong in this area, but that person is world class. And so let's give them that stuff. I'm world class over here. I can do this really well. And try to bring out the best in the team when you work that way. Oh, you want to check to see on reification? That's a funny word. Yeah, what does it mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used the term before. Reification actually means make it again. Re make so again in the why. same way? No, um, well, I-fi would be, so going back to the Latin. <laughs> so, so 
Uh, the reason that it, it's actually quite important in computer science when they talk about reification when they're doing object-oriented programming. Because when you're doing objects, you define that this is an object and this is sub-object, it's class, class structure. So this is more important than that. So the reification idea comes out in the system changes stuff because I said, most people think about system and change. And I'm going, no, system changes is a reification where it's not systems and then you add on change. And it's not change where you add on systems, it's actually something different. So it's like how you make something real. Sorry, I just literally Googled reification yep. in sociology. Complex yes. idea for when you treat something immaterial, like happiness, fear, or evil, um, as a material thing, which for me is so much design because you're constantly taking something that's abstract and then trying to turn it into something that people either use yeah. or apply or and that that process is yeah. the negotiation of what are you going to actually choose. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I, I find design to be a, um, a pejorative term. I actually oh, like yeah. the term maker. Yeah. Maker, because what you're doing is you're remaking things. And if you think of yourself as makers, what is it you're making? Decisions. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would argue design is design and not making, because making infers, like, oftentimes, I think, like, a singular person creating something, whereas, like, design is, like, for an aggregator for a bunch of specialists to make something. Okay, let me reify that and talk about the community of practice around it. Yeah. A designer by himself is not going to get it done. No, but they're not. They're the, they're the aggregator for all this stuff. Right, so, so I'm framing it, I'm reifying the term because in effect making. So also, not, that's not maker, it's making. Mm -hmm. And so, so th this is part of practice, right? So practice is, is action oriented. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about how do you do making in a team? And, and if you say reifying, reifying would be we reconfigure the way that we're making something, which I agree with you would be the designer has a big role in that. Uh, the designer might also discover while they're doing the design with someone who's actually hands on to making something physical that it's actually not possible to do it that way, right? So, oh, yeah. yeah. Is it, you have to decide. Is there any relationship to the Marxist notion of reification? Because like oh. it sounds yeah. like a little echo there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, because you make social systems. Yeah. The second is the design and the emergent. Design is only one structural element. Now, here's the most important line from the whole book Practice cannot be the result of design, but instead a response to design. In the book, Wenger starts off with the example of insurance adjusters. So insurance adjusters go through and they assess a form, and the question is, is this a fraudulent claim or is this a real claim you pay out? And so people in the computer system design the information system and they design the workflow, and it's kind of like, okay, we have all the rules, you know, and, uh, and so we'll help the adjusters actually figure out whether they should accept or reject the claim. And in that, they, they create this trap because it gets really, really complicated. Now what the insurance adjusters actually do is they learn that if you check off box H and G together, it rejects the claim. And so they're responding to the design, which is they're actually treated as professionals where you know, after you've read all these insurance claims, you kind of get a feel for, well, this one is clearly fraud, and this one is clearly should be paid out. And of course, the stuff that are in the middle requires a lot more investigation. But what, we, what we're trying to not do here is design a system so that they're locked in like machines. If you're going to, be, if you're going to have it that, it, that it's going to be a machine function, then why not just design the machine? Forget the human being. Why is the human being there at all? And that could be the case where there are things that you can automate and the human beings don't add anything. But if you're actually thinking about a system where human beings can make a contribution, then you actually want them to use their knowledge and use their judgment. And what they will do in order to get, quote unquote, the right thing done, is they will subvert the very system that you designed. Mm -hmm. It's the picture of UX. Have you ever seen that picture of a, of a lawn with a pathway on it? And there's, there's like the sidewalk, and then there's a path that is actually worn through the lawn from people walking that way because they're like, why would I 
walk in an angle. That's the difference. It's like you want to make paths. You don't want to make sidewalks that go like this. You want people to actually use what you're doing. So there is there this argument you're making that 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 you that intervention is inevitable. Well, so what 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 could be done is when you have you have a field and then you see where people naturally walk yes. and that's where you put the pavement. Pay attention to what they actually want instead of what you think they should have. Number three. The complex relation between the local and the global is a paradox. No community can fully design learning with another, and at the same time, no community can design its own learning. So now you get inside the system and outside the system. Because the community of practice, there's a local community of practice, people that work with you every day in and day out. But then outside of that group, you've got larger communities of practice that know things. So an example that they had in Xerox, the original John C. Lee Brown article was on uh, copier repairmen. And so the copier repairmen would get together and have coffee every morning and they would discuss, you know, what are the problems they're having with these copiers? And they have all these new copiers, new models coming out all the time. And they go, this is where the breakdowns happen. I'm having to fix this thing over and over again. Now, this is not written up in the manual yet. And so they learn you know, over coffee. But then the question would be, well, what do they do globally? Like, that's, so that's fine for the people who are working here in Toronto, but in Montreal, do they actually learn about that? And maybe they have a different fix, and maybe they have a different circumstance, and they come up with a better way, but you have this balance between the local and the global. The last is between identification and negotiability. So we have this dilemma, and it creates fields of identification and negotiability that orient the practices and identities of those involved. So what is, this again comes down to reification, what is important when you're saying that you're identifying something, and can you negotiate around that? Now, negotiate is not like bargaining. Negotiating is like negotiating a curve. So if you are actually fixing a machine, like the, 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 the people are, uh, like the repairmen are, then can you actually follow the rules or follow the best wisdom, but then actually say, well, actually, in the situation, I tried a different fix, I tried a different way. So the negotiability is not about, about sticking to the rules. Now we're going to turn to the Matrix. Can't see this; it's dark. So you know the scene with uh, Cipher in the Matrix. You know, I know the steak doesn't exist. I know that I put it in my mouth. The Matrix is telling my brain that it's juicy and delicious. After nine years, you know what? I realize ignorance is bliss. <laughs> so, do you want to be inside the Matrix where everything is comfortable, or do you want to be outside the Matrix <laughs> where things are real? Now, the reason that this is important is because back in the days of the Blacks, this is actually 2002, this website came out. This was by Warner Brothers called What is the Matrix? Uh, you can only find it on archive.org now. But there was this article, Existential Phenomenology and the Brave New World of the Matrix. I actually discovered that he republished it afterwards. So we have this idea. Hubert Dreyfus was the Heidegger scholar. He passed away a couple of years ago. He was the Heidegger scholar at Berkeley. And uh, he's at the foundation, one of the people in the foundation of all of the work that's been done around phenomenology. He has a book called What Computers Can't Do. And so he was one of the first people, he was at MIT when they were doing all their artificial intelligence before they got into the, uh, into the uh, uh, AI winter, as they call it. But he was saying that, you know, Technology is not going to solve all our problems because there are things that are about, uh, about being human, about being, that you understand Heidegger, you understand Meryl Poxy. So, when we're talking about this, what he says, Heidegger thinks that our freedom to disclose new worlds is our special human freedom. Okay, I'll have to unpack what that means. Disclose new worlds. Each world only exists once it is, exists only when it is disclosed. Now, a world is, I'll get to that, um, <laughs> from the matrix. What is ultimately important is whether we are locked into the world of routine activities or are free to transform the world in ourselves. So the idea of disclosing a new world, now part of you coming into the SFI program says that you guys actually don't want to be the guy eating the steak inside the matrix. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Although, or we want to make the experience machine that creates you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
This is interesting in foresight. On, on our first day, we did the axis of how much power and, and how, how uh, positive or negative you thought the future was and how much power you thought you had over the future. And you stood on the axis of where that was. And there were actually quite a few people who believed that it was negative and that they had very little power in the SFI program, which is why I said maybe. <laughs> so for people who want to follow through, um, these are the, the recordings of uh, Hubert Dreyfus in Philosophy 185 at Portable Theater on archive.org. I listen to these while I was grocery shopping. I'd load up my player and I'd go grocery shopping. And it turns out that um, someone that knew Dreyfus, I told that when I did, he said, oh no, the Dreyfus brothers would love that. There's two of them at Berkeley. And they go grocery shopping. What they do is they walk into the grocery store and they just break apart. They, and they go through the store <coughs> properly. And then they come together at the end and they figure out the most efficient way of looking at it. And uh, just reflecting on that, uh, so there is a, uh, a discussion, and it's in one of the lectures uh, that he talks about. And this is where you get some of the uh, distinctions within systems thinking. Is Hubert Dreyfus was having dinner with Francesco Varela, who's the guy who created the idea with uh, Umberto Majorana about uh, auto voices, uh, self reproduction. And he said that, uh, as he was having dinner, he said that he was, he said, Francisco is so wrong, and I pounded the table so hard and knocked all of the, all of the glasses off the table. <laughs> and, and, and the reason that we're doing phenomenology, and the way he says it, is that, in essence, when you talk about, uh, and this has been the system changes project, two ways of looking at it. You can look behaviorally, which is looking inside the system. And when you are inside the system, this is like being a monk. I'm going to sit and meditate, and then I'm going to figure out what's actually happening and find a better path for myself. The other alternative would be being in the world, engaging outside. So as much as you see me up here lecturing, I'm a real introvert. And so you have to approach me before I'll approach you. But being in the world is important for me. I have to be out because if I'm only inside my own head, I don't get anywhere. I actually need to be out in the world. And so when you have that distinction, you have all these sort of things that happen about the way you think about the world. Dreyfus has, uh, among other things, uh, these categories of learning. So how many do you learn? And there's actually three versions here. Um, so I, I'm going to track through them. Uh, the idea of novice, advanced beginner, competent, proficiency, and expert are five levels he has. And what he, the way he approaches this is responsibility um, and how your skills work, and then as you progress here. So you start off as a novice, you follow the rules, and you're only capable of following the rules. Then you begin to identify that the rules are conditional, that they're, they're different branches, rules have nuance. You learn the ongoing principles, spelled principles wrong. Uh, and you start sorting the information on relevance, so you start understanding that some rules are more important than others. Then, if you get to be proficient, use pattern recognition and know what you do, and you use the rules about how to do it. So you have intuition that if I follow these sorts of patterns or rules, then it gets done. When you get to be a master, an expert, there's no pattern or analysis required. What happens is you see beyond that and you do what works. So I had this experience when I was working at IBM, because I was trained in management consulting, and the way that IBM trained in management consulting is they have methodology. And they've got different tools, different techniques, different artifacts to create. And the reason they do that is that when IBM engages on a consulting engagement, if I get wiped out, which I actually did, um, I got a bad injury and went to have a cataract in one eye, I removed myself from the account, someone else came in and filled in afterwards and said, oh, I understand what David's Liverpool are, just pick up right here and go. That is a process-based methodology. The other way I can work is expert-based methodology, which is, okay, I see that there are 10 deliverables here. We actually only need three of them. Now, everyone else that works on this engagement wants to do all 10, but I actually know the three, I know how to shape the three, so we don't have to do that, and we can do it faster. The problem with relying on an expert, though, is an expert gets wiped out. You have a single point of failure. And so the question of whether you design for an expert, whether you define for a group of people who are proficient, is actually a design point. So in 2000, we had this framework. Uh, I like the way it's expressed in this article um, in 2014, and, uh, and we described it as changes between, in four different categories, 
Uh, but that article is actually old because it uses the, uh, the original 1980 definition. And so this is what the uh, 2004 one looks like. So the components are you start off context free, and you get to a state where it's like, well, it's not context free. It depends on the situation of how you're going to move forward. The perspective, only when you get to be competent can you actually choose what you're going to do and, and, you, get, and you get to the experience. Uh, decision to how to act the situation, you use analytical reasoning until you become an expert, which quite becomes intuitive. And then the commitment that you're involved, and commitment is an important thing I come to, is whether you actually are committed to the decisions, the practices you do. And so, if you're just following the rules, you can be detached and say, I'm just following the rules. I'm just following the rules. Uh, but at a certain point, you become involved with understanding, and then you get really involved in deciding and outcomes in the situation action care. What you are doing is lots of logical designing. This is an article from uh, Design Philosophy Papers, so it's actually in your field, uh, Anne Marie Willis, because people are going to go, what the hell is ontology? And ontology is essentially the question of what is. What is? You're shaking your head. <laughs> no, I, I just like that your expression. We oh, covered you know it. Yeah, we covered it in the class. Okay. So there is ontology. There is the ontic, and there's ontological. Okay. So when we're doing ontological design, we are actually now in the process of making, and you are making reality. Now, whether that's a reality for a person or not, it's an interesting question. And you can do this by shaping the way you think about things. Uh, Tony Fry says there are three things, the design object, the design process, and the design agency you get involved in. But ontological designing is a relation between human beings and the life worlds. Uh, it's fundamental to be, being human, and it's how we design our world and how the world designs back on us. Now, within that, we do what is called history making. History making is ontological design. And when we do that, we have a world and we disclose the new world. The way that Spinoza, Flores, and Dreyfus describe um, history making is it changes the way in which we understand and deal with ourselves and with things. And so the examples they talk about are the feminist movement and sending a man to the moon. So you're changing the ontology because when you're talking about men and women from the 1950s, you go up to the 1960s, the way you talk about them is different. And when you talk about them that way, that becomes the reality. So can you design that reality? A new world is disclosed to space in which webs of practices and things have meaning that are no longer strange. So, a practice is strange. So, take something simple. A woman going to work in the 1950s. Why is that woman working? She's not have a husband supporting her? That's strange in the 1950s that woman had work, was working. She doesn't have to work. She can stay at home. She's taking care of kids. But now, in today's world, it's not strange anymore. So, there's been a change in ontology in the way that we think about the world and we think about things around them. Any organized set of practices uh, for dealing with oneself, produce a self contained what it means, a disposed space, a world has three characteristics. And now we're getting down into pure Heidegger here. Uh, there's the equipment, which is like a hammer, the purpose, like building a house, and then there's identity, such as being a carpenter. And so you can part from multiple worlds, and they intersect with each other, but you end up now with the idea of world, just like you end up with the idea of community of practice. Are you part of that community? Are you part of that world that, where you are legitimate, and you are participating in that community? Style is the ground of meaning in human activity, on which practice can serve a basis for developing new practices. So in this case, we talk about style as different ways of practice. Um, 
We do it by the way that we coordinate actions, what matters to us, and what's transferred from what situation to situation. And this gets into the transfer is the reproduction of social practice. Uh, in the book, they, they have a story about why are Japanese babies quiet? Well, Japanese homes are quiet, and the babies come into it, and so they become quiet. So why are Japanese homes quiet? Because the babies are quiet. Why are the babies quiet? Because the homes are quiet. And so you get in this circle. But that's a style. And so, you know, the Florida and Dreyfus say that Japanese mothers tend to be soothing and mollifying, while American mothers tend to encourage passionate gesture and vocalization. So there is something that happens when these children become part of Japanese society. And being part of American society, in contrast, it's raised a different way. It's a different style. Now, one is not right and one is not wrong, but they are different ways of practice and they are different ways of being. So there is, um, when you talk about history making, is it really history making or is it not history making? There's what's called customary disclosing, which is everyday activity. And then you have the changing of style, which is historical disclosing. So the idea we have here is two types of skills. One is the first bill to sense on and hold disharmonies. So if you were on a trapeze, and your first time on the trapeze, taking a big step off, firstly, you want to hold the bar. And you got to get comfortable if you're looking down there holding the bar and then you swing off. So you're dealing with these things going on inside of you, which is a disharmony, which is like, is this really a good idea to be on the trapeze in the first place? And you're holding on to the bar, you're holding on tightly. Then what you have to do is you have to be able to change one current disclosure of space based off the disharmony. You have to actually step through. So anyone that actually goes and gets on trapeze, lets go and flies, has actually made their own history. Disharmonies are practices in which we engage because you could fall, then common sense leads us to overlook. We don't really want to think about that. There are three ways of looking at, three ways in which new worlds get disclosed. The first is articulating. Articulate is most, most familiar, and what happens is it comes, and when you're looking, and you're looking at something in a different way that you weren't paying attention before. Um, the examples you talk, they talk about space race. So Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon. Is it that science wasn't advancing? No, what it did is it gave it a focal point. A focal point and say, we can put a man on the moon within the decade. And it's like, oh, I thought about that. We'd always thought that there'd be space flight sometime, we'd get on the moon sometime, but all of a sudden, he draws through attention to that. That's reconfiguring the way that we talk about things. The second of, uh, uh, of reconfiguration, configuration is more substantial because something that is, uh, that is marginal becomes dominant. And in this, I talk about the change from animals to um, machinery. And a good example would be going from riding on horseback and then you have bicycles. So we have to ask, why is it that we actually have bicycles constructed the way we have them? That you put your leg over and it's kind of like riding a horse? That's because we took the practice of riding a horse and we cross-appropriated that, and that's how people understand it. So if you came out with a recumbent bicycle and everyone's riding a horse, I'm like, well, that's weird. That's not natural. It's very strange. So how do you make the strange less strange? How can you make that transition? And the first one, cross-appropriation, when you take a practice that doesn't exist in a community and you bring it and, and you bring it all from another community. And so they claim that the feminist movement wouldn't have happened except for the civil rights movement, the black movement in the United States. What, what they did in the civil rights movement um, with the blacks became something that all of a sudden you can do that, you can make that change. And so they're cross-appropriating from one world into another world. Denning and Donham actually have a whole book on this, Innovation of Language Action, um, and they have a, a process where they think that these are the things that you should actually do to be transforming the organization. I'll leave that for you to read if you're interested. We're going to change now the commitment and language action perspective. Uh, we'll talk about conversations for action. 
don't know how many of you know this, this story about the uh, chicken and the uh, chicken and the pig. A pig and a chicken were prominent walking down a Fort Worth thoroughfare when the chicken suddenly proposed, let's stop in yonder beanery and eat some ham and eggs. A thoughtless and repugnant suggestion was a pig's response. Kindly remember to you that a dish of that sort is a mere contribution. For me, it's a total commitment. Eggs are the contribution by the chicken. Ham is a commitment by the pig. And so this come up in the adult community. So what does it actually mean to be committed? Here's a fun article that's in Strategy and Business. Fernando Flores wants to make you an offer. Fernando Flores was the uh, Minister of Finance in Chile uh, when the Lende fell. Uh, and Amnesty International got his family out. He ended up at Berkeley studying under Dewey Dreyfus and John Searle. Uh, there's another coincidence you want to go through the arts, which is Stafford Beer was working with Fernando Flores uh, before that because they were trying to figure out how to do the uh, uh, run the whole Chilean government and uh, industry. But what he does is that he says that we should be using speech acts, and a lot of the problems we have in human communication have because we don't understand what it is that we're doing with our speech acts. Here's what conversations for action look like. So we start off, and this is like buying and selling a house. Request, Lorraine, I want to buy your house. <laughs> Promise, Lorraine says, okay, or maybe she doesn't say okay. She goes from state two, and she says no. Uh, so she declines. Or maybe I say, before you can say anything, sorry, take my mind. Okay? Now, there's another state here, which is you can counter, and Lorraine says, well, you know, my child actually wants his house, but, you know, we could talk about this. Maybe you could buy it in like 50 years or something, and I go back and forth on this. But suppose we actually get to state three, which is the, uh, that we actually have an agreement. After you have the agreement, I, uh, Lorraine will come to me and say, here's the house that you bought. And I will, I can say, yes, that's the house, and, uh, and complete the transaction. Or I could decline and say, uh, didn't you say I was supposed to get the chandeliers with that? And decline the report. And it could de degrade and say, if you're not going to give me the chandeliers, I'm going to actually kill the whole contract. Or it could be that we both cancel and withdraw from this, right? So, so these are these speech acts that we go through. Now, the interesting thing about this is that when this is ontological design, because when you're making a commitment to someone, you're actually making a promise, and that becomes their reality. So anyone that's ever worked on a team where one of the team members doesn't deliver, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> this would be a breakdown in what uh, Fernando Flores calls. So the interaction between language and action are linked through directives and permissives. And what we say in language action, the reason it's called the language action perspective, we say people act through language. The contrast is a perspective that people process information and make decisions. Now this is again coming from the Xerox Park orientation and Silicon Valley orientation. There's multiple ways of designing computer systems. One would be, would just present the insurance adjuster with all the information and it'll make the decision. The other would be that, no, they act through language. And so they're talking on themselves. And so someone will say, wow, we can see this claim. I'm not sure how to handle this. And they're working around the system through the communities of practice. The original article they published, which was called Doing and Speaking in the Office, was a question about what do people do in an office? What is communication? And they have this theory of commitments. And so the first idea is that organizations exist as networks of directives and commissives. Directives are do this, commissives are yes, I will do that, I agree, I commit to that. And that's how organizations work. It's, it's really all social. People say they will do things and you negotiate with them and that's what they do. Breakdowns will inevitably occur and organizations will need repair for them. In a process of coping with breakdowns, whole new networks of directives and commissives are triggered. So breakdowns are not a bad thing, they're a fact of life. When, you, when someone commits to something, so I had the saying, inside of IBM, you don't get shot for not meeting the goal, you get shot for not telling someone before 
you get to the deadline. You want to tell people early that you're not going to make that commitment. And then people can actually rearrange and make a new commitment because like, okay, well the customer is not going to sign this contract within this calendar year. It's kind of like, okay, you know, and then we do change them? No, okay, we'll have to work on next year. So David, we have about like two minutes. Left. Okay. Uh, the process of division of labor uh, is you have to have the anticipated breakdown built in because that's the interaction between the people. There are three types of conversations in addition to the conversations for actions. There are conversations of orientation. Most of what I do for you in this classroom is conversations of orientation. You're just trying to get to know what the field is, understand what's going on, what's important, what's not important. Then we can have conversations for possibility, speculation. As you get into your physicist maps, you're going to start having discussions about, well, what's possible? Can I use this model? Can I not use that model? Is this going to work? Is that not going to work? And then the third is a conversation for clarification. This is after you get the breakdown, which is, oh, that didn't go the way we had, and we had planned to do this all together, or we have the commitment, we need to change from the commitment. Uh, I had done this when I was at IBM, so in the Adaptive Enterprise book, and the way I got the system thinking was there was a commitment management protocol that Steve Heckel had invented uh, based on Flores' work, and I was supposed to implement that technology. And from that, I figured out there are four types of commitments that you should consider. There's a commitment to produce a deliverable, which is on a certain day, I will deliver a thing. There's a commitment to follow a process. Following a process is what happens when you go to court. They don't guarantee you the outcome of whether you're going to actually succeed, win, or lose in court. They do say you're going to follow a process. The third one is the commitment to provide a capability. This is working behind the scenes when you have a capability, and the best example of that is a call center. When you call in and you get a busy signal on a call center, that's not a failure of a deliverable. You haven't gotten that far yet. It's not the failure of a commitment on a process. It's that the call center manager didn't have enough staff to cover. There wasn't enough capacity in the system in order to carry that out. The fourth one is a commitment to a relationship. It turns out that people fail in their commitments all the time, but we forgive them because you're committing to a relationship. Often you hear, you know, no big deal, I'll get you next time, right? And in families, you end up with these sort of networks where it's like if they, you always have them committed to the relationship because it's something that you can't get rid of. Commitments are linked upstream and downstream to each other in different ways, and so when you have a breakdown in one part of the commitment, it causes, um, it causes failure elsewhere. Just thinking about how these work, the commitment to deliverable is more, is more public. The commitment to relationship is more private. There's a lot of things that happen through relationships. I've had business relationships where we don't discuss stuff on the phone. We don't send email. We just talk, right? You meet and talk. Because you actually want that, uh, you, you want that privacy associated with it. So there's less disclosing. Also, in the other axis, there's one about um, intimacy, uh, whether it's inclusive or exclusive. So if you are doing deliverables, they're actually pretty apparent because you see the change in the world, but if you're doing relationships, then those are mostly invisible. Okay. That's a lot on language action and disclosing, which <laughs> your brains are now full. So let's get back to the principle behind this. When you're thinking about change, think about systems change. How is it you're going to change that system? Because you know that unfreeze, change, refreeze doesn't work. You have to do part of it as disclosing a new world. Now, when you disclose a new world, that means that you as designers may see something that other people don't. And so essentially, I'm a science-based guy, but the way I appreciate the arts, the arts tends to get intuitions about the world and things that are happening in the world before people in science can actually prove it. Science actually happens after the fact. So in, in practice, often that comes up but through the through the work of creating a shared vision for what the future might be, where you're you're working together to say what are the conditions that are ideal um, that we're trying to move into and then have consensus on what those conditions are, not at a very tactical level, but at a strategic level, so that people have uh, what Peter Senge would call enrolled, not buy-in. He would, he would say they are 
enrolled in the process. Uh, because that uh, co-creation of the vision helps to guide and ensure that as you're moving towards it that people stay with you and they don't go, no, forget it, I'm not doing that anymore. But that, that's hard work. And often people think that, that that's the work of co-creation where it's like, do you want a green chair or a yellow chair? Like that's not what the co-creation or development of the vision is actually in service to at all. You're, as, when you go out in the world, you're going to hear co-creation so much. It's the new thing that everybody has latched themselves onto. I'm not sure. I like to see where this fits in your... That would be a start. Oh, mm. Yeah, because because within that it has its own conventions, it has its own understanding of the world. And culture. And if you're, if you're not part of that, you kinda of go, I don't understand what these are doing. Yeah. And and if you brought that process, like if you brought that style into some organizations, they would look at you like you had three heads. <laughs> and then other organizations are like, Yeah, we've been using it for years. It's intuitive for us. But, yeah, it's probably important to know that, yeah, style is what makes it connect because, yeah, the language, the language acts or the speech acts as, you know, just based on the theory, nobody really speaks that way. Although there are people that would come out of Fernando Flores' trainings. And, and I, took, I took a training course of, um, with Flores' group, um, uh, Transformation Technologies, and had the coordinator software in the 80s. And we came out of, uh, of a uh, training in kind of a, a, the transformation of sales as a conversation. And it used that kind of framework. Uh, there was a network of, of, of committed conversations that came out of sales that was very similar to, to David's uh, example in selling a house. I and mean, that's, like that's like a sales conversation, right? It's the same kind of thing. But out of that, people w would be saying things like, um, I have a request to make of you. I have, you know, and that's, that's a, a powerful statement in that it, you know, the response to that is, a, is either a commissive, the acceptance of the request, and you've just changed somebody's future, you know, uh, commitments. Just, you, you, you've got a step toward history making uh, out of a request. So there's this idea of making powerful requests. Um, so the commissive would be the response to that request. The other option, of course, is a is a uh, uh, you know is, is that you don't accept the request or you uh, or you renegotiate it. But for a very strong request, that's that's how things are done. And that's actually like these are like steps in in formation of of business conversations of organizational. Um, I mean, going beyond organizational learning to organizational action that takes into account uh, these, you know, the, the awareness that it would take uh, to to make these to use language in that way. Does, has anybody uh, has, has anybody taken courses like this? Is anybody familiar with Landmark, for example, too? Uh, landmark education. Yeah, Fernando Flores was an advisor to, with Werner Erhard in Landmark in the early 1980s. Is yeah. like a Landmark consent where like, people come together and share their feelings and then help them stay? Yeah, yeah, well, it kind of grew out of F. Very much like a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. Actually, it's not like that. Yeah. So but much. It, ha it, it has yeah. turned into a weird thing. Yeah, I don't know what it is like yeah. today, but it's it used to be smaller. It's been referred to as like a cult. Yeah. 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 Uh, do it. And I'm like, yeah, if you come, like, come to this session, $750 to then do it. I'm like, yeah. no. Yeah. So there's actually interesting work going on with uh, Werner Erhard and Michael Jensen. And Michael Jensen was the uh, professor out of Harvard that created principal agent theory. Um, and now the Flores, if I got to do search on Flores and uh, Jensen, you'll find this whole body of work that's in the Kennedy School of uh, Government where they've been teaching. Because you think about changing the world, 
how is they change the world? So talking about landmark and S, while I'm not necessarily a fan of the of the um, group that's there, the theory is that people actually don't see themselves. And so can you do ontological design, which is change the way they see themselves, like other people see them? And so I actually met with someone a few weeks ago because he, he hit me up on LinkedIn and said, oh, this guy was the director at Landmark. I had oh, that lunch with him. And so, and so we went through this discussion, and it was clear to me that when he was younger, he was having a lot of issues with identity and you know these sorts of things, and he worked through them. And, the, and, and so I see that that is the value for him in doing that. But not everyone needs that. It depends how, how well you see yourself. If you don't see yourself in the world well, then you need to do your own history making and change yourself. Once you get into like organizational design or like even just like leadership, um, some some fields of leadership, a lot of it leads back to that. Like if you if you start reading uh, um, Ed Shine or mm -hmm. Adam Kahane, like things that that start to get a little more around um, like the way that you navigate those kind of spaces. They do start to get very much about reflective practice on who you are and how you show up in the world. Yeah, Henry Mintzberg yeah. writes on that a lot. Yeah, Henry Shine. His work on um, humble inquiry is one of his recent books, which is humble consulting. Very, very powerful. Yeah. <laughs> which is a style of language. Mm. You look like you have a question. So Ed Shine is a, a practitioner of, I, I don't know, I think or, organizational, organizational development. development and design. He's prof prof professor at uh, MIT. Is this the, uh, what they call the spiral dynamics? No. Like no. Organized by the no. no, that's 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 integral theory, yeah. yeah. Ken Wilber and Don Beck. But you probably yeah. know it as Fred Lelou, too. That teal stuff is, yeah, no, that's a different thing. So th this is much more grounded in, um, I would say like those those things are similar, but they're not the same. So Ed Shine is a guy who really looks at, at how individuals interact in organizations and then also how organizations emerge in the world and how they work together and all of those things. And then, but he wrote also about how to be a better consultant. So I say, read Ed Shine, everyone. He's fantastic. Um, and Peter Block. Peter as well, Block. Who, yeah, oh my God. Also, yeah. If you haven't yeah. read the book Community by Peter Block. Community, The Power of Belonging. Yeah. Get it. Yeah. Like A S A P. Peter Block. Yeah. And he also wrote on on kind of uh, on consulting, consulting up until that point. So it's, until he retired from. If from, you're sorry. Yeah. No, you first. If you're moving into a space where you, you are going to be expected to be doing co-design or co-creation or hosting kind of social conversations around shaping design, all of those things are very, like all of those books that we just talked about are super connected to the practice of, of actually making that happen. And they are grounded in this. Like they are all grounded in how are you actually going to activate all of this theory in a way that makes sense for me. Yeah, understanding yeah. this helps me to be able to, to pick and choose what am I going to take from those incredible thinkers who thought about this and wrote books that I can buy on Amazon versus what am I going to take from the incredible thinkers who've published where I have to like go into a journal and, and read something that feels like an obstacle where I'm like, oh, now I can build my own tool because I actually understand the theory behind why something is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And then I use work from people like Ed Shine to like help inform in situ practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, like you don't ever stop reading more stuff. Yeah, um, <laughs> Shine's book, uh, Humble Inquiry, is about uh, is oriented towards management executives, but it's uh, the very idea of it is to, to hold a style of conversation where learning is created by, ask, by asking questions, not telling, basically. Mm -hmm. Very hard thing for people in uh, positions of authority or leadership to do. It means 
putting yourself deliberately in a humble position of respect to those within the organization, but it also helps you from making categorical, ontological mistakes by assuming that you already know people's context. It's, it's, a, it's a way for, for, for leaders to actually learn and to create learning as an individual practice. Peter Block is very similar in, in his work. The Answer to How is Yes mm -hmm. is an amazing book that precedes community. And Peter Block explicitly uses language action mm -hmm. and, and language, language action perspective um, in, in, all, in all of this work. I mean, he talks, uses it, I mean, in the same way that, that Flores advised Landmark, he, he yeah. learned from that same and and it's also like super. It's not prescriptive, but he actually gives you like like tactics around hosting and shaping conversations, mm. so that you can get into the space of disclosing those new worlds. Like it, it, he gives you kind of more practical connections, but very connected to what we're talking about. And I would say like the majority of people who are talking now about. They'll, they'll call it like, oh, a patient advisor committee or a co-design committee or a co-creation session or whatever, community engagement even is often the thing that they call it, um, which is trying to, to create, sometimes, trying to create equity where they're inviting that conversation at different levels. I would probably, like, if this is what you're going to go out into the world and be doing, like, all of this is so applicable in, like, how do you make it, how do you, have, how do you have those conversations where people are at all those different levels and coming from all those different perspectives and then also understanding all of the systems and literally like operations and governance and technology and then also how am I gonna actually navigate that like somebody has a terrible lived experience of this, this system and their opinion is so valid and so important and maybe the CEO is caught up in that expert space where it's like, I know what's happening and you don't get to tell me what's wrong with what I'm doing. So it's very, that, that's a very difficult um, thing to navigate and, and do in a very authentic way. But you can do it. So yesterday, I actually uh, facilitated an engagement with a group of arts organizations who are looking to build out some digital transformation tools. That conversation is not about, let's design digital transformation tools. That conversation is about, okay, arts organizations who don't work together and have different funders and who have <laughs> completely separate governance structures and different mandates and different ways of understanding the practice and different unions for your, for your actors and actresses and, per, and performers. How are we actually going to do something that has a systemic impact that is going to support what we're trying to do without leaving people out who are organizations of maybe two and including organizations that have 300 or 400 people and have a massive capacity to do things. That, from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock yesterday is what I did. So <laughs> that, those conversations are very common and people want them, but they're very, very complex to have. That result in commitment? Uh, yeah, the so end? the end result of that, so I told them that we were not going to have commitments by the end. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I knew they didn't have enough of a sense of what the thing they were trying to do was. They were very connected to the digital implementation of the thing. Uh, first and, day, too. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so instead of uh, giving the thing a name, because they just know it's a digital transformation and they're making something digital, we <laughs> called the product pineapple. And so... Instead of having them tied to, oh, well, it's a streaming channel. Oh, it's uh, YouTube videos. Oh, we're going to air something on CBC Gem or whatever. It was, so Pineapple is going to connect us in this way where we do this thing because they, were, they were, would get mired down in the detail. Mm. So let's keep it very high level, which is why I didn't get them to commit to anything other than we will move forward with this project as long as these commitments or as these uh, conditions for desirability, viability, feasibility are met. So they set conditions for, for success and said, if we meet, if we continue to meet these and we all agree, 
we will move forward. But that's a long, like, man. That's pretty good. That's, that's good. Well, from 10 to 3. Yeah. <laughs> also, I mean, arts organizations are cats. very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> very much cats. And there's an interesting, I think Stephen Jots, it says, don't herd the cats, uh, tilt the floor. That's a, I think about that stuff all the time. Like, and and uh, uh, um, Buckminster Fuller, you know, don't don't fight forces, use them. Those are like those are like Yoda like sayings for me in doing this work because you got to look at where are there stylistic forces that I can use and adapt. Like if people want to, I don't know, if maybe big decisions are happening when people are going out for smoke breaks, let's figure out how we can leverage that to like do something instead of. Be like, how are we going to fight those smoke breaks? <laughs> Not that people really smoke anymore. But. <laughs> yeah, a few more minutes for, for questions. I'm going to talk about the survey. The question will be how you put this on a synthesis map. Oh, well, I think, yeah, well, I think, I think too, it's connected to, to how do you, how do you negotiate the experience of developing the synthesis map? So as you on your teams are working, you are doing the process of co-design and, and, and collaborative creativity. The reification. All of those, the all of that sense making that's happening mm -hmm. while you are, while you're kind of bringing together the research that you've done and your understanding of this space, that is what you're, what the synthesis map represents. So it's just a visualization of all of that stuff that you on your own have kind of chewed up and then everybody just kind of spits it out and you make it into a thing. That's the synthesis map. Um, but that navigating spaces and all of those, like all of this is so applicable to SFI and working in your groups and figuring out like how do I actually collaborate with people who maybe I have nothing in common with other than we're in the same program. <laughs> well, this is also a, a really necessary area to cover in advance of uh, the dialogic design workshop. Yes. So that's going to be really it's it's two stages. So over two weeks, two you know two class sessions will be uh, exploring continuous critical problems or one of the original um, representations of wicked problems and how they might be addressed through social systems design, through design of complex, you know, of, of complex uh, systems within society that can yield the outcomes that we prefer, that can design, can actually create committed steps in organizations and institutions and policies for, for real action in our futures. You have to have, you have to have a ways of engaging multiple stakeholders, multiple levels of power, multiple commitments towards uh, an understanding for, for actions that can be shared by all and agreed by and, all. We don't have that today. And over a so space a of, a design, right? yeah. of a design process where you want to bring people in at the very, very beginning, but they're not necessarily always there at that very, very beginning. So mm, the, that's another, yeah. it's another part of the, the complexity of hosting those conversations is often people are brought in at a very transactional level for co-creation, whereas dialogic design is more about like giving more space to bringing people together to have those conversations over a longer period of time for deeper outcomes. And being able to create spaces for dialogue where, where the under, without having to explain uh, what's entailed in speech acts yes. or in theory commitment, that people experience that there's already a level of understanding, a level of dialogue, yeah. and, and where your word is being taken as a commitment, and you're being listened to, you're creating a space of listening for authenticity and autonomy for each speaker it creates a very different environment for for participation and for for individual power to become collective power. And so that's why we speak about dialogue in a different way and why these so we look at, at, at some of this is still very current theory. I mean you go back to what I mean a lot of this is based in late nineties, mid to late nineties. So the books have passed around and and Dreyfus and the um, 
uh, the Dreyfus work and the Spinoza Dreyfus and Flores disclosing new worlds, the uh, uh, communities of practice, all that was before 2000. Mm -hmm. And it's still so, so far ahead of what we are normally able to do. I think we're getting better at communities of practice, for sure. Mm -hmm. But we tried to employ that in the knowledge management era, and which I consulted in with a company called Origin, and the led a international practice in knowledge management as well as the development of practices for that. And we thought we could create communities of practice in our client organizations. They wanted to use software, of course. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. So, <laughs> Shocker. So, so if you all read uh, Nanaka and Takeuchi's mm -hmm. um, uh, knowledge uh, uh, process on knowledge creation. On tacit knowledge and in the, in the use of tacit knowledge, you might have had that in human factors. Yeah, yeah. That's that was the basis for for then communities of practice. Mm -hmm. David, I might have been out of the room when David touched on that, but this is all still very current. There's also a great so uh, there's to understand what's the difference between conversation and dialogue, or when you say like we talked to forty people is very different from saying. We had a dialogue with 40 people, or we listened to 40 people is a completely different thing to say. But dialogue, uh, and I'm using the David Bohm kind of definition, is like a conversation is more like a ping pong that goes back and forth, like I'm waiting to talk, whereas dialogue is a, is a co-created communicative act, right? You're bringing communication together as people to create something that's bigger than you. It's a very creative thing to do. So do we want to talk about the survey now or after? Right.